from Byron, Mississippi, it's Lakeshore Church. And now we join Pastor Jay Frazier for today's message. The verse of scriptures, verse number 17 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. Let's pray together. We thank you, Lord. I'll simply ask for my words to be yours and my thoughts to be yours, and we'd walk in obedience to everything that we hear today. And I pray, God, whether it's through media or in this room today, if there's someone, God, that has not experienced you, that has not taken you at your offer, you've been pursuing them, they understand, God, right and wrong, they understand the conflict that's going on within them, I pray, God, today is that day. And we would be more aware that this is the ultimate, this experience that every one of us needs to step out of an earthly into an eternal experience with you. And so, God, we pray, Lord, in advance for what you're going to do. We're going to praise you now and forevermore. For we ask it and pray it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. So far, as I said, we've done two of six. I want to show you that. It was up there a minute ago. And and, um, I want to show you that, that two weeks ago, be the third Sunday now, we, we looked at the conflict. If you've ever wondered where good and evil came from, why you have a conscience, why you feel bad when, when, when something goes on, uh, and many other uh, characteristics of that, it's the conflict. It started in the garden. If you remember that sermon, if you heard it, or I'll refresh your memory, or if you, this is the first time, then hear this. That happened in the Garden of Eden. That is when sin was born. That's when the conflict was born. And we live in that ever since. And then we talked about last week, because of the conflict, because of sin was born in the garden, God's been pursuing us ever since. Long before we pursued God, long before you walked an aisle, long before you accepted Christ into your life, if you have, God was already pursuing you. And he was pursuing us to bring us to this basic that we've entitled the experience. I've had some great experiences in my life. Um, just some things just blow me away. I mean, I just never would have thought uh, one, and it, it it meant a lot when it happened, but it surely means a lot now. It's uh, I had the privilege back in the mid '80s to go to the to the World Trade Center, and uh, I went up the the uh, elevator, and you're going really fast, and you get to the hundred and seventh floor. You come out on the observation deck if you've ever been there. If you haven't, you won't because of what happened on on September the 11th, 2001. But you come to the 107th floor, and then you go up an escalator, and you literally go outside. You, would, you, you could go outside on the top of the World Trade Center, one of the towers. 110 floors. What an experience. As long as I have faculty, I'll remember that. <clears throat> a few years ago, I was invited to go to California. Never been to California before. And Suzanne and I, were, we were celebrating a 25th wedding anniversary that year, so that was our anniversary trip. And I had the privilege and honor to play Pebble Beach for the golfers in the room. Uh, I love to tell people I birdied number 17, which is a par three, and I parred the famous 18th hole. I don't want to talk about the other 16 holes. I'll just stay with those two. But uh, what a wonderful, wonderful experience. My dad and I, he was at the first service today. He's been here for the wedding, and, and uh, he and I flew on a, a jet together. Had uh, common, <coughs> common kin folks that uh, actually had a jet, and uh, we actually flew from Atlanta, Georgia, down to Florida and played golf and came home. Uh, I understood for about seven hours how the other part of the world lives, okay? <laughs> have never experienced that again since. been on a commercial airline uh, several times. So, so I've had a lot of experiences. I could talk about a wedding 32-plus years ago that I've never gotten over. The birth of my children. Many of you would know that just this past Friday night, we, we made some more memories. Uh, if you know our history, January the 8th was another experience that we had that we will never get over. So we had a lot of experiences in our life, but listen to me very clearly. None of those, and I've had many, many others, none of those compete with the experience that I'm telling you about today. Let me give you some, some, some aspects of, of it. This experience, to, to know that you can know God and know him personally. Hmm. To know that your sins can be forgiven. Some of these things that maybe people would doubt today. To know that you can speak to God and God can speak to you. The liberal pundits, it's, it's just part of who I am. But in this day and age that we live in, there's so much today. The controversy of today is, is the, the, we're talking about life. 
And we become so jaded on what's going on. Thank you, Bo. There's so much that's going on in our world today that we become jaded about this whole thing. And I mean, the liberal world is going crazy over life. I want to remind you publicly, listen to me very carefully. If a person's not safe in the safest place God ever made, we're not going to be safe on the streets. Liberal pundits going crazy. Our former vice president, who is a believer, child of God, made a public statement. Somebody asked him about prayer, and he said, yes, I pray. And when I pray, I speak to God, and God also speaks to me. And when he said that, the liberal media went crazy with it. I'm not making this stuff up. We live in a day and age. But I'm here to tell you that you can have an experience with God, that you can speak to God, and God can speak to you. You say, how in the world does God speak to you? He can speak to you audibly if he wants to. I know he speaks to me through his word. He speaks to me through you. He speaks to me in my prayer life. Sometimes we don't need to be sharing our Kroger list with the Lord. Maybe we need to listen a little bit and hear from him. He'll move on your heart. (laughs) We have a conscience. He can be a still small voice. He can be a rushing mighty wind, whatever you need and whatever capacity you need him to speak to you. And as the text says, listen to this, that you can know a new creature. The old has passed away. I believe this because I've never found it anywhere else. I believe in the life and death thing. This is where we got the terminology from. That when somebody experiences Christ in salvation, they go from being an old creature to a new creation in Christ. I believe that's where we got this saying that we pass away. That the old has passed away and behold, all things have become new. Let me tell you this and you just need to hear it. There's something wrong if we experience Christ and our life doesn't change. I'll go so far to tell you this, I think if we experience Christ and our life doesn't change, I wonder if we experience Christ. Top just fell off. It's okay. I'll make it. All right. But understand this. All right. Listen, here's another way. You can know that you're no longer a stranger of God, but a child of God. I've been reminiscing a lot about this children thing, of course. And I want you to know this, that I got to drink some, I'm going to spill it. You can know God. And the scripture says that we're no longer a foreigner or a stranger. But we're a fellow citizen with the saints of God. That we're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. Because I'm just here to tell you that you can know God. Mm. And when you realize that conflict is going on, And I really believe that. I think there are people just out there in the average world that don't understand. Why is all this good and evil stuff? Why are there so many lines drawn in the sand today like never before? Why is it that it seems like there's big groups of people that can't get along? Because we live in a fallen state. That's where the conflict came from all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And then people understand the pursuit of God. You might be here because it's Mother's Day and you're trying to make it right by being in here with your mother. (laughs) And already what I've said today and maybe part of the worship or whatever's going on, that you already feel something going on and you're going, man, what's this? I remember a friend like it was yesterday told me, he said, I don't like going to your church. He said, I feel bad when I go to your church. And what was he saying? It was conviction. It was awareness of where we stand with God because there is good and evil and there is a conscience and we are fallen. And because we're fallen, there's a conflict that's going on in our soul and for our soul. But there's also in this conflict, there's the pursuit of God in our life. When something's not right, God loves us enough to arrest us. He loves us enough to share that with us for us to have the opportunity to make it right. And he brings us to a decision. When we realize we're lost, when we realize there's something lacking, God brings us to a decision which we've entitled the experience. I want to share with you some details about the experience, okay? The first is this, and this is huge. I would say very few things I say more important than what I'm fixing to tell you is this experience is the hinge of everything that we are, the hinge. Many of you would know that for some time we've been working on a house. Many of you helped working on our house. And uh, we, we, we moved from our house, we sold it, and we bought a smaller house and added to it and been remodeling all that. I've been fascinated by the, the things that are out there with, with, in that world. Some of the modern technologies, right down to hinges, I've been fascinated now that you can shut a slide on a drawer and it can get to a certain part and then it takes over and shuts itself. If your house doesn't have this, they have them at Home Depot. I just want you to know that. I mean, I've been fascinated. I've been fascinated by doors that you can start to shut and they'll finish shutting themselves 
all because of the hinges. I've even seen it in toilets. It's amazing. If we could just go back 20 years ago and say, if you'll just start putting the lid on it, it will finish. Maybe the children would have started so that the mechanism of the hinge could finish it. But we can't go back. Hinges. Listen to me seriously. When I think about a hinge, everything that we are hinges. Mm. See, what it is is today, if you're doubting that, never experienced Christ, all I can tell you is there's a door that Jesus Christ says he is and the hinges. If you will experience him, you will experience an unbelievable life beyond the hinge. (laughs) But let me tell you this, hinge is also defined this way. It's defined as a central point or principle on which everything depends. Everything that we are, everything that we hope to be, hinges on Jesus Christ. So you can't minimize it. You can't be good enough to be right with God. There's not. The Old Testament writer says your righteousness is filthy rags. There's no way you can be right with God except through the atoning blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the hinge. See, it, it, it's the hinge. And, and we, we're, we're understand this and that we're in one room and God wants us to be somewhere else. One existence. We're lost and God wants us to be saved, and it hinges on a relationship with Jesus Christ. Someone say, how do you get from this earthly life into the eternal bliss with a holy, righteous God? It all hinges on Jesus Christ. I went back and found a sermon that I preached some time ago, and it was, it was entitled, Less to Full. And the sermon was understanding that we're less, but God wants us to be full. And there's some great words that even say that in our English language, that we're hopeless, but you know, in Jesus Christ, we're hopeful. And that's what, that's what it means. Everything hinges on that. And we need to be reminded of that, folks. I'm all about education. I'm all about people pers- uh, furthering themselves. I'm all about success and people having things and doing things and accomplishing things. But that doesn't compare to a relationship with Jesus Christ that ties together the earthly with the eternal. Not only is it the, the, the hinge, but it's also how. It's how do we get there? How does it all end well? Nicodemus questioned this when he questioned how to have eternal life. If you remember the story, he's the one. And Nicodemus is the one that heard John 3.16 for the very first time. That's always fascinated me. I've always said when I get to heaven, I, I have a list. I, I have a list of family members that left a long time ago that I want to see again, that knew Christ, and I'm going to see them again just as sure as I'm here today. I'm going to see them on that tomorrow. And there's others. Of course, I want to see the Lord and I, I want to see, I've always thought about the Apostle Paul, and there's a bunch of others. I think about church members. I mean, there's a lot of people. I could create a big list. But think about it. For I, I've been fascinated for years and years and years about Nicodemus. I really have. He's only seen three times in Scripture, only three. Little snapshots, little, little portraits, if you will. But we know there's a lot more because we see how those three go together. I don't have time. It's Mother's Day <laughs> to share all that with you. But I will tell you, I've been fascinated. He was the one who heard John 3, 16 in his ears the very first time. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But he started out and said, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said this to him, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus in that day would be like someone having double or triple PhDs in our country, in our society today. Very educated, very intellectual. He was the cream of the crop. And yet he heard Jesus answer him and say, listen, if you're going to have eternal life, you got to be born again. And he said, how can this man of all this intellect, he said, how can a man enter his mother's womb a second time? That's the kind of answers I would give, I'm sure. He said, you got to be born of the water and the spirit. I hope you understand what that means. It means you got to be born of the water. Everyone here was, by the way, physical birth, but you've also got to be born of the spirit. You have to be born again. It's this experience that we're talking about. See, being born into this life does not qualify you for heaven because of the conflict. You with me? See how it starts to make sense now? What happens is, it's because the conflict, you might not have ever thought about it this, but even maybe, just maybe, you realize today that if you don't know Christ, God's been pursuing you to the point to allow you to come in a place like this today to hear the good news of Jesus Christ because it's God's pursuit of you. And in that pursuit, God brings us to make the decision about the experience. Hmm. It's not to be good, 
That's, that's a lie. You can't be good enough to be right with God. It's not about doing better. We'll talk about that in the coming weeks. It's not about what we do today like Lady Justice, that we've done enough good in our life and the pluses outweigh the minuses, therefore I'm going to heaven. That's a lie straight out of the pit. The Word of God even says not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter in. I believe there will be a bunch of people who did well in their life. They did good. They were righteous. They were moral. But they weren't right with God because they hadn't experienced Jesus personally. Hmm. It's how. It's not those things. Oh, listen. It's the experience of salvation. Two more I want to share with you this experience. It's also our hope. Love the word hope. It's one of the big three. Our hope is in place through being born again. But I want to remind you that in this hope thing, Paul called Jesus the, the blessed hope. I want to show you a passage in Titus, Titus chapter 2, and just some phenomenal verses. It says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And I just want to remind you of this word. It's in here twice, but it's for all. And I've already said it today, but I want to tell you, I don't know who the chiefest sinner in this place is. I know some of you be pretty close what I know about you, but I don't know who would be the worst. Sometimes, you know, we'd say, oh, I'm really bad, but I just want to tell you, he didn't die for some, but he died for all. Amen? Well, Brother Jay, you don't know what I've done, and you don't know what that guy did or that girl did, but I want you to understand this, that Jesus didn't die for us to up to a measure of sin. He died for all sinners. And anybody who cries out and confesses and wants to experience Christ, God's provided it for all people. Mankind has done a ju- disjustice when we start trying to have theology and doctrine that sort of portrays a picture that all people can't be redeemed. That's not what the Word of God says. And I think we struggle, and I say this often, us finite beings struggle with an infinite God, that God knows right now in the future who will and has received him and has experienced Christ as their Savior. And I think we struggle because if we knew the outcome, then the outcome should, should do something for us today. But God has. He's given us a choice to make for him. It's our hope. Paul called him the blessed hope. And look at this. For the grace of God. Go back, guys. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Verse number 12. Instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lust and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age. We're going to talk about that in the weeks to come. While we wait for the blessed hope. While we wait. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, Hmm. while we wait for the blessed hope, blessed hope that we have. See, this experience, it bursts hope in us. Someone say, Brother Jay, when is hope lost? Hope is lost when we lose sight of Jesus Christ. (laughs) Peter was doing just fine walking on the water till he took his eyes off the Lord. See, we need to remind, see, think about blessed hope. We know he's blessed. We know he's blessed. We know he's godly. We know he's sinless. We know he's sacred. He's sacred. But the hope part is us keeping our eyes on him. Hmm. The experience that we've experienced him and, and we know him hmm, shows how we're to live. And give you one more quickly as the experience is also be, need, need to be reminded that it affects the hereafter. Salvation is instantaneous. People that say you work at your salvation, we got to make sure we tell people that it starts off with an experience. And after that, the experience is progressive. It is something that we work at. But salvation is not progressive. It's instantaneous. It happens in a moment. You and I could get in a car right now. We could drive about seven hours, and I could take you within two or three feet in a little church where I accepted Christ as my Savior in an altar much like this one. Hmm. See, it's, it's, it's that experience. As we'll talk a couple of times before we end today, could, could you take me to that place? The experience. When we came as a sinner, the old song says, just as we were, and we accepted Christ, and we had that experience of, of salvation with the Lord. Hmm. Everything changes. That's the neat to think about. Everything changes in this experience, <laughs> including heaven. Remember last time we were talking about the pursuit, and our text was as if one has lost a coin or one who has a 100 sheep lose one sheep, and they go out and find it. They leave the others, and they go find it. It says about the sheep, when he does that, he tells all of his friends, and they come together, and they celebrate because we found the lost sheep who was lost, and now it's found. Remember the rest of the passage? It says, in that same way, there's rejoicing in heaven. When one that was lost is found. You know what that says to me? Think about this today. I don't know on this Mother's Day, but there might be one here that you got hoodwinked into coming because your mother said the best thing you can do for me on Mother's Day is come to church with me. Now, if that applies to you, your mother did not call and tell me to say that. 
But there might be one on the sound of my voice today, maybe even out in the world wide way of that you've not experienced Christ. Let me tell you what would happen today if you do. Not only would there be rejoicing here. And church, I want to remind us that it's pretty sad that we, we cheer more for college football outcomes than we do about a soul that's born into the kingdom. Ouch. We just pass it by by where people stand with the Lord. Sometimes. I'm even guilty of that as well. But listen to me, this, the, the passage, the parable says that when one is converted here, if someone was to invite Christ to come into their life today and experience him as their Savior, listen to me, I believe with everything about me in the celestial, there's rejoicing going on. It's pretty neat. Lost some wonderful people. And just think about it, even family members. Maybe you had a godly grandmama, a godly granddaddy, and they've gone on to their eternal reward. And just know this, over there, when you did or when you do accept Christ and experience him, what we're talking about today, in a born-again fashion, that, that second birth, just know that they're rejoicing in glory. That's pretty good stuff. It's our hope, and we're affecting the hereafter. Hmm. Making heaven full comes to mind. I had a great youth pastor, phenomenal church that we saw in Rockford, Illinois. I heard them say this, that our responsibility every day is to be making heaven full, hmm. affecting the hereafter. I want to close this way, but share a couple of things with you. This is a great sermon for Mother's Day. You say, how in the world? <laughs> because just like our lives were radically changed when we became parents, our life in Christ is supposed to be radically changed as well. I think about this often. Uh, we didn't have children right, aw right away. It, it took several years to, to have our first one. And um, I remember I, I, I used to preach. I, I, this is true. I had a sermon years ago that I had 10 points in it of how to raise your kids. I enjoyed every bit of it because I didn't have any. I said, the apostle Paul, he didn't have any kids, and he's telling us all how to raise our kids in Ephesians. I said, surely I can attempt this, and it was just a mess. It was like it went right off the platform onto the floor. Nobody really got anything. It was terrible. And then we had a child. His name is Zane. He's here today. I, when we had a child, listen, I'm not kidding you. I realized I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything. And, and, and I didn't change the sermon, but if I changed it and preached that 10-point sermon again, it would be entitled, The Three Suggestions of Parenthood. And the subtitle would be, You Don't Have to Listen to Them If You Don't Want To. True. But I remember when we didn't have any children and we were married, there would be people come up in all their piousness and, and spirituality. They'd say, Preacher, you just wait till you have a child. And then I noticed something. We had one. And then that... that Brought us, brought us into the club a little bit, but then there were others that had more than one. And then they would come up and say, well, you just wait till you have two. And then we had two. And then there was a, a, a greater, big, smaller club, but there'd be people who said, just wait till you have three. But I noticed something. After we had our third one, I've never had anybody that has more than three children that said, wait till you have four. And it hit me one day, why? I really believe this is truth. Because once you have more than two, and each parent has one, there's at least one on the loose somewhere. And I mean, right? So what does it matter whether you got three or 12? Whether you got nine or 10 on the loose or one on the loose, it doesn't matter. Once you get past two, one of them's on their own at any time. My mother used to say it never bothered her at all taking us to a public place. And like I said, she had seven. Never bothered her at all. And we asked her one year, why? Why? She might be watching this right now. She never bothered me at all. She said, I knew if I took y'all to the mall, if somebody snatched one of you, she said, all I had to do is just stay right around there where I think they snatched you. And 30 minutes later, they'd bring you back and apologize for taking you. <laughs> Once they saw what she was dealing with. The whole experience, listen to me. Had a good time with that. But Mother's Day and parenting, listen to me. The whole experience is about change. I didn't have a clue before I was a parent what parenting was like. I always think there should be more in the word than this. I think God is intrigued with us figuring it out. It's about loving and caring for him, and then you got to fill in the blanks. There's no cleft notes in the back of the Bible for it. You just have what we have. But let me tell you something. This, this experience that I'm talking about today is about change. Listen to me very carefully. The heart is changed. Hmm. Very plainly in the word of God, it says, inwardly, I'm changed. I'm a new creation. My life, our lives in Christ are changed. I would tell you this, not to scare you, but if you say today, hey, I experienced Christ right here in my life, if there's not an after Christ experience that's different, I would wonder if you experienced it. Not here to hurt you, 
But I do believe, I, I think the word's very plain. Some people have mi- gotten mixed up on this whole experience thing. I'll give you some more. Your, your outlook in life has changed. I'll give you another one. Your view of other people has changed. Doesn't the scripture say, how can you love others whom you haven't seen if you don't love me whom you have? People today that got all this animosity and stuff in their heart toward other people, they need to check up. We talk about having a vertical relationship with God and of the cross and, and the horizontal doesn't reflect the vertical. Something's wrong with that picture. I'm not talking about people getting on your last nerves and people that are like you and people that have hurt you and things of that sort. But somewhere you've got to bring that to the cross, folks, because he didn't just die for you. He died for them, too. They might have made a mess of their life, and they might have made a mess of your life, but God still loves them, and God still died for them, and his still, blood is still there for them. doesn't mean they're right in what they're doing, but somewhere we got to realize and put some of this stuff in its right place. Hmm, we're different. This experience is about change. And I believe this. We've already talked about heaven. Our destiny has changed if we know Christ. I want to remind you of that. That's great news today. And one more. I believe it's everything about me in salvation, this experience, is being born again. What really matters changes if you know Christ. What really matters? <laughs> Man, I'm all about education. I'm all about behaving. I'm all about respecting your elders. I'm all about a thousand more things. Well, let me tell you something. What I'm most about is knowing him. Mm. Analyzing that every day. Oh, I got to go, but I want to re- re- remind you of some things today. Preacher, I'm on board with you. What are you talking about? I want to give you some, just some basic things. Might be something you have to go back and listen to. But how are you saved? Really, when you boil it all down, how is a person saved? Well, we're told in the Word of God you're saved when you repent and trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. Look at Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Look at it. For you are saved. There's your answer. By grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift. That's important because a gift is someone else pays, <laughs> right? Huh? Someone else pays. Jesus paid it all. I got to trust him. Hmm. It's God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast. Watch this. Verse number nine. For you are saved by grace. I'm not, but there it is, not by works so that no one can boast. We're there, all right? So we're, how, can, how do you know you're saved? There it is, all right? How, how are you saved? Who can be saved? Well, you know what John 3.16 says. I've already talked about the word all a few minutes ago. But look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord does not delay his promise as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. There's that word all again. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. Hmm. He pursues you to bring you to the experience. I invite you to visit lakeshorecmc.org to find out more online. That's lakeshorecmc.org.